Um, if there's any problem with the sound or image, and you could just tell me and anyone in the comments, that would be really helpful. Uh, para o pessoal que está vendo do Brasil, né, esse webinar vai ser totalmente em inglês, né, a gente vai estar tá fazendo ele com o Roger Longden. Então, daqui para frente, a gente vai fazer a maior parte das apresentações, em diante, aqui em inglês mesmo, até para introduzir o Roger né, daqui mesmo. So, ok, uh, we're going we're gonna to be waiting like maybe two more minutes, um, so we don't lose too much time, but also to make sure that everyone is, is in. So we're just waiting for like one or two more minutes and we're starting, okay? And if you have any questions either in you know, Portuguese or English, uh, you can just uh, leave that, those uh, in the comment section and we'll try to answer them as soon as we can. Uh, this one webinar is gonna be a little bit less about a presentation like the previous ones were, and it's gonna be more like a chat. So we're, we're gonna talk a lot about um, many different topics uh, related to uh, like OKRs and differences between European and Brazilian market. Ok, então uh, só uh, trazendo aí o pessoal do Brasil, se puder deixar comentários em português, inglês, ali, um formal para vocês, a gente vai tentando responder. No né, webinar de hoje, um pouquinho diferente dos anteriores, vai ser no formato mais de conversa. Uh, a gente vai bater um papo aí com o Roger, que tem essa experiência uh, europeia, né, do mercado de OKR, para trazer um pouco disso para nós, tá? Ok, so we're waiting. Um, just one more minute. Uh, well, I think, yeah, yeah, let's go. So uh, first, uh, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have all of you here. My name is Gustavo. I'm a chief revenue officer at Coblu. We're a leading Brazilian OKR company that works as a SaaS and consultancy firm. Uh, Blue Week is a series of webinars dedicated to bring relevant insights to inspire your business management. There are 100% free and long online webinars, special guests and themes related to company culture, OKRs, lean strategy, and performance management. Uh, also, uh, check, out, check us out on social media. You can find us on Instagram at coblue underscore OKR and LinkedIn at coblue. Uh, our guest today is Roger Longden from Derby Giants. He's going to talk about OKR in the European market. So I'm just from so Roger is specialist in management and measure, measurement of performance in organizations. He's a recognized international speaker in the practice of professional growth and alignment and is known for his work shaping practice around the use of objectives and key results. He has worked with multiple international clients, helping them to re-engineer their performance systems and the cultures in which they operate. He's also a guest lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University Business School on performance management. In his work, Roger has ventured from Formula One all the way to the middle of the North Sea. Companies he has worked with over recent years include PwC, Kindred, Sports Scotland, Mercedes F1, Nexon CNOC, Betty Gaming, British Caribbean Insurance Company, Salesco, Vision Express, Bad Paula, Encompass Corp, and MEG Corp. For the past 10 years, he has led a performance consultancy, Derby Giants, which has built a reputation for being a global leader in OKR practice. Their podcast, Giant Talk, attracts an audience of over 10,000 people. Before leading TBG, he was with Fuji2 for 12 years, working in sales, account management, operations, and strategic transformation. It was while with Fuji2 that he graduated from Halley Business School with a postgrad diploma in performance coaching. So, hey, Roger, it's a pleasure to have you here. I think it's about to show up. Hey, Gustavo, great to be with you. Hey, I hope I didn't commit any mistakes. So, if, if no, I mean, no, 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 you, you did it. You got it absolutely spot on. Absolutely okay, spot on. yeah, great. So, Roger, I think we could start uh, just by you talking a little bit about Derby Giants, or what do you guys do, a little bit about uh, your company's experience. Sure. Uh, so Derby Giants has been in existence for about 10 years. Originally, it started off with just me. Um, and uh, as, as you said in my bio, I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a qualified coach. And originally, when I left Fujitsu, I just went into just uh, providing one-to-one -one coaching and so on and so forth. But it, it's evolved since then uh, uh, into the performance management consultancy, which it is today. 
I have a strong influence from sport. I am a qualified rowing coach and I have worked with elite athletes and uh, at international level. And I, I really get the mindset of someone who is prepared to push themselves and take risks, calculated yeah. risks, but risks all the same to, to, to push themselves to go that bit further. And I've always been passionate about how you can translate that sort of mindset, that sort of uh, behavior and those sorts of tools across into in, into the workplace. And um, I was also, if you, if you kind of put that to one side, the other thing which I've always been fascinated about because organizations that generally do it so, so badly is the management and motivation for that matter of performance in many organizations particularly larger corporates for many years it's been the annual appraisal and objectives that are set on a, a 12 monthly cycle some if they think they're going becoming really agile they'll put them on a six month cycle well yeah, yeah it doesn't we're, quite cut it does it we've seen some of that here yeah uh, yeah maybe some companies here they, they still plan for 10 years believe it or not like yeah. 10 or five yeah. Yeah. wow yeah, that would be great to have stability for ten years. <laughs> yeah, uh, but but the uh, so uh, you know that frustration with how poor that that process has been for many years in terms of well, in terms of three things: in terms of what it does for the business, because let's face it, you know, as as we were just saying, you know, you don't have stability for ten years; you don't even have stability for twelve months, pretty much nowadays. Yeah. So the, the markets and the pressures which you uh, – competitive pressures which you're operating under all the time demand that you be agile in the way that you execute against your clan and develop your strategy and so on and so forth. And then also, let's just think about the people involved in the process. It doesn't matter which side of the table you sat on, whether you're the person doing the appraisal or the person uh, receiving it. You know, yeah. it's, it's never a great experience – um, for a whole load of psychological and uh, 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 reasons that I could I could spend another hour talking about, uh, um, but basically it was my dissatisfaction with that very very important business process, and also a desire to see um, a desire to see really really good performance in the workplace that benefits not just the business. It's got to benefit. It's got to be a win-win for the for the people as well as the business, <clears throat> and that's when uh, I did some research about five or six years ago, and I, I wrote a. I was basically curious. I'm quite a curious, quite a curious person, and I was curious about what innovative organisations were doing to 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 tackle this challenge because I'm sure I wasn't the only one in the world that had seen it, um, and there yeah. would be some who were kind of ahead of the curve. So I wanted to try and find out for myself and also share that so i wrote this paper called priming for performance and that was where through my research for that that's where i came across okls and like i said it was about it was about five years ago and it, they were like this beacon and i was like that's it it's a structure it, 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 in a way it, it, i mean back then i used to think it was a structure it was like you, if you're doing them this way then that's that's you're doing okrs i've kind of shifted a little bit of my in my view of exactly what okrs are now. yeah, yeah. Um, i believe they're more of a set of principles and practices really rather yeah. than a, de a, a definitive black and white model um, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's more about um, uh, it, it was more about finding a way that you could uh, kind of build a, a bit of a structure for executing, but then do it in an agile and really engaging way that was that benefited the people in the business. And that that's to me that's that's the essence of OKRs. So so that's kind of how we ended up at that, and because they are. Uh, a collection of principles and practices as 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 a not a definitive model you know a lot of people read measure what matters and think that because john doa wrote it it's the bible and therefore it must be followed interestingly yeah. we're getting a lot of uh businesses that are coming to us now saying well we read the book and we did what it said but it's just not worked for us well you yeah. see that's only one <laughs> take on it We've so, seen that too. We've seen that uh, a lot. Right. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, it's that's really interesting. So um 
there is an opportunity there, as I'm sure you guys do consultancy around this, to help organizations interpret those principles yeah, and, cool. and, and design the right structure, the right OKR structure uh, and, uh, 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 and, and, and system for themselves. Okay, And I don't mean system as in software, although that's part of the mix, but I mean organizational yeah. system of how, you know, where do OKs, OKRs fit into the organizational landscape and how do they interface with the other key processes which are going on, like strategic planning and performance management and so on and so forth. So, yeah, there's a, it, that is... For me, that's the first step and a really important step in the change management journey for OKRs because I've seen OKRs fail because the change just hasn't been managed. Um, I've seen them fail because people have thought, you know, it's a new tool, everybody's behind it, let's get it in. And actually people are going, hang on a second, what is this? Why? What is this something more I have to do or, or what? You know, and these... Yeah. If you take the time to design it, you take the time, that helps you to kind of preempt these questions, work out the answers to them, help make sure that everybody's on the same page. So when they do come up, everybody's giving a consistent answer. Everybody's got a consistent view on, on what OKRs are being used for and what they're not being used for, which are two really important questions which that everybody needs to be clear on. So, yeah, so it's that, that's how that's how we've come about. So there be giants exists to help clients uh, uh, interpret and apply OKRs in a way which is going to really drive the growth within their businesses. That's what we do. Yeah, that's, that's great, Roger. I think there's a lot we could we could just start by uh, picking up from what you just said uh, and doing those like parallel experiences between like what you've seen there and what we've seen here in Brazil. So like first thing uh, is that I totally agree uh, that OKRs are a set of principle, principles and practices, just like you mm -hmm. said, uh, mm -hmm. more than it is a like closed framework that you need to follow exactly as it is. And uh, that wouldn't even make sense because if you, you go into the literature and, and you see for the different books that haven't been uh, written about it, mm -hmm. uh, they they also have differences among one another. Mm -hmm. So there, there just isn't this like definitive, uh, like ultimate framework that you, you're gonna follow and no matter what in your company, yeah, uh, I think it's a lot more, more, more a lot more about uh, following the principles. I've had a couple of experiences where I, I'd go um, into a, like a video conference like this, and there would be like f five people on the other side. And I've asked like, "Have you guys studied anything about OKRs?" And then everyone will literally at the same time like <laughs> get the book up, like measure, yeah, measure <laughs> yeah, cause, yeah, it was like, yeah, yeah. we're doing like this. I'm like, yeah, great book um, and great author too. Um, um it's, a, it's a great guy and i've never met him but i, I can see from when he writes that he's a great great person i'll, and, I'll, let, I'll let you into a little secret although yeah. i know there's other people listening in um he's writing a follow-up to it now oh yeah that, that's a spoiler actually yeah it is a bit of a spoiler and i think he's, yeah because because there are some points which people took quite a bit of issue with in the book and i think he's kind of writing the second edition just to kind of maybe redress some of those. So yeah, I, I can this, imagine what, what's the space. Hmm. But but I think he really gets a concept, and that's what I, mm. I try to, to to go really into when I, we're going to companies like. Uh, do, do, can you can you get the concept of what it, of what it is about like alignment with the company's yeah. vision? Is is that an issue? Um, yeah, I, I've read your report, so I, I know that's one of the things we, we're going to talk like yeah. later a little bit more about your report, but. I know uh, there's a point where you talked about alignment with the company vision. Yeah. Uh, is, is there something uh, when people come looking for OKRs that they ask you a lot about? Uh, and do you think uh, companies have been uh, able to help people inside a company get really aligned with the company's vision? What, using OKRs? By using OKRs, do you mean? Yeah, by, yeah, by using Yeah, them, absolutely. Absolutely. That's where it should all come from. You know, the, 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 if, if it doesn't, then you're kind of not following the strategy and ultimately, you know, navigating in the direction that you want to get to. You know, the vision should be your North Star and your OKRs, your sat nav to get to that North Star. Yeah, that's that's the way I look at it. Um, I think I think you I think you hit the hit the nail on the head with um, measure what matters is great at kind of guessing across the principles of particularly of alignment. Yeah. The, the other book, which I, I'm a big fan of is radical Fro focus by Christina. Christina. 
yeah, yeah, I've read the one. And, yeah. and, and that that one really focuses more on the the, the, the habits and the rituals and the routines. Uh, and to me, that's what OKRs live or die, die by. Because if you just set them at the beginning of a period and then don't actually do anything with them until the end of the period, then it's kind of nothing's changed. That's the way that's the way objectives have been used for decades. You know, this yeah. is about OKRs. If you use them in the right way, it's about bringing them to into much more regular, if not actually daily, conversation, so that they're front and center, so that when people are making decisions in the moment as to where they should be focusing their time, what they should be doing next, uh, they are making informed decisions because they are fully aware of the priorities of the of the organization and how that translates through into into their team and how that what that means for them. And yeah, that's yeah. that's true agility. That's true agility because historically there was. Uh, either confusion, so people would have to sit tight until they confirmed and it'd go up and then it'd come down again, or they'd just go, right, okay, I'm going to do this. I don't know if it's right, but I kind of feel like it is. You know, if somebody is fully informed and really, really clear and has that focus, then they can make those informed, intelligent decisions, and that's agility there. It's not some great big myth. You know, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Um, uh, it's cool. You're talking about agility, and mm. usually when you're talking about it, uh, th there come there are a lot of questions about like Scrum and sprints, and a lot of parallels between OKRs and, and Scrums, and and usually uh, they they suffer from the same issues. Like, uh, what is the point of like implementing like Scrum or some other methodology if you don't try to establish some routines uh, mm. that make it part of your day, so you're actually making decisions based on them. So can you, can you see this parallel between like like Scrum and OKRs? Definitely, definitely. You know, Scrum is 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 fantastic for applying Agile to your projects, and I've always thought of OKRs as actually applying Agile to the whole business. Yeah, certainly, yeah, certainly, certainly, the activities that are going to drive if 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 you if you use OKRs in the way that we use them, that are going to drive your growth, change, or innovation. We don't suggest that you use OKRs for managing business as usual activities. That's what KPIs do. That's what yeah, they do. Definitely. And and they should work in parallel with OKRs. You know, to you to just go back to that analogy of you know the the vision being your North Star, your your OKRs are your sat nav showing you the route. Uh, your your KPIs are telling you whether you've got enough fuel in the tank for the journey. Yeah, I get it. I, I use this example a lot really. Yeah. So uh, it's okay about like business as usual functions uh probably you mean like finance or yeah or yeah, yeah. O operate operations uh, like, yeah, uh, operations. uh call centers you know cust customer support that sort of thing yeah they, they yeah. will mainly be running on kpis unless there's some change or innovation yeah. that's going on in those areas yeah, we, we did have this um this company that it was going really it's go growing really fast And it was one of the fir uh, first times like, that, that we talked to the, like a finance department and a customer support department where I feel like OKRs would be like really fitting because they were growing so fast and changing so fast that those activities, they were not, they haven't become like sale. They haven't become so much of business as usual. They yeah. probably will be at some point, yeah, but not in the middle of this big, big change. Yeah. So it's quite possible that what you see originally appear in an OKR If it's an initiative which works and it establishes and moves into business as usual, you can see it pass over into a KPI. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. definitely. But, yeah, okay. So uh, moving on to the uh, next thing here. So uh, I, I think that uh, it's the time that we could talk a little bit about the difference in the market. So maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, how you see the British and European market in general. Uh, about four OKRs, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we see it in Brazil. Okay, so even though I'm here in the UK, I actually think the UK is pretty backward in terms of OKRs. Uh, okay. I mean, we, I, I would, I would put an exception in that and say that the the tech digital software sector, yes, you know, that is always the sector that's going to be ahead of all others. But in terms of sectors outside that adopting them pretty pretty slow to, to on the uptake in Europe we see uh, more uh, uh, wider spread adoption 
um, we see manufacturing organisations, we see uh, uh, finance and insurance, for instance, looking to use them. You know, those mature uh, uh, businesses, which, like I said earlier on, desperately need to get uh, wake, wake up and become more agile. Um, so, I mean, there's a whole load of reasons why you know people have got their eye off the ball in the uk at the moment um uh, you know it's not a great place to be doing business uh, uh, right now but yeah you know in terms of in terms of europe they they work really well and 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 also i've noticed some um subtle differences in 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 different uh, areas of europe like for instance in in northern europe um we where you've got germany and i would include in that you know, they they kind of like structure and they kind of like a little bit of process, yeah. and they and they and they kind of like that once they've kind of settled on how they want to use OKRs. They kind of really seem to be quite good at getting into the routines that then underpin them, which is like I said before, that's 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 the, that's the critical aspect to OKRs is getting the good routines in place. Yeah, 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 great. Like, yeah. If, if, if you talk a little bit about, uh, like, how it is here in Brazil. So, basically, the, the, a lot of those things are the same. So, mainly tech companies are the ones that are using OKRs or at least are the ones that are talking to us yeah. or coming, like, looking for for the, for the all of this, um, like, for OKRs in general. Yeah. But we, we, we're starting to see, like, um, well, as you said, like, other industries start tackling into this, and methodology and like agility in general, lean in general, uh, but it, but it's uh, it's really new. Like if you go to a place and ask, like let's let's say you're going to do a lecture to a bunch of companies, and you ask uh, to raise to people to ra in to raise their hands if they know what OKRs is, mm -hmm. uh, most of them are just not going to know. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I agree. I agree. It's still. Uh, I think if you know the, the the diffusion of innovation curve with the innovators, early adopters, uh, I do, where, I do know that. yeah, where the tipping points at which it goes from uh, early adopters into mass market is about 17%, 18%. And I still don't think we're quite at that point just yet. But I can see how over the past couple of years, things have definitely moved forward. I mean, we, we're now working with uh, uh, insurance companies, uh, councils, um, uh, 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 yeah, you know, some some uh, even uh, arch architecture and construction. You know, we're definitely getting outside the realms of uh, of tech and digital. Although the majority of our work still is in that sector, um, yeah. but uh, yeah, I can see it expanding out of that, and that's great. That's absolutely great. Yeah, th there's something that people ask us ab uh, about a lot. Uh, here in Brazil, at least, uh, when people come to us uh, looking for OKRs, they're also looking for performance reviews and also looking for uh, some way to establish uh, a routine of feedbacks. Mm -hmm. So it's usually like those three things, they come a lot together here, like performance reviews, feedbacks, OKRs, and I could say a fourth one, which is KPIs. Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually those four. Uh, how do you how do you see those things like meshing up together? Because uh, if you read like uh, uh, measure what matters, uh, uh, John talks about a lot about uh, CFRs, like conversations, feedbacks, and recognitions. Mm -hmm. I think that so, that mixes up of OKRs. Yeah. Now this is this is a, a very widely debated uh, topic, isn't it? How do OKRs link in with performance evaluation? I yeah. Guess, I guess is what you're asking there. Um. So I have a rather pragmatic view on this. Um, I think it's easy for the purists to say, oh, don't ever link them in any way, shape or form. Um, but, you know, if you work in Silicon Valley where you've got unlimited budgets and you can afford to fail multiple times, then great, crack on. But in <laughs> elsewhere in the world, you know, budgets are not quite so uh, uh, plentiful and you have to, you know, you can't afford to have as many failures. You can some, but not as many. Yeah, so sure. my my thoughts on this are that it's not constructive to directly link OKR achievement or attainment with a certain amount of bonus or pay. So, yeah. you know, if you get if you get 100% on your OKRs, then you get you know a 20% pay rise or 20% yeah. bonus or whatever. I don't I don't believe that that's the right way to go. But what I do believe 
you can use OKRs for is in a in a, in a more rounded uh, 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 view of somebody's performance. If they're working with OKRs, I think there's merit in looking at and exploring the question: Well, how have they actually worked with their OKRs? What's been their approach? Have they have they engaged with them? You know, if if it's someone that you've had to chase for updates and continue, yeah. then they're, they're really not buying into it. But if it's someone who's been on the ball, who's been helping to manage the process, because it shouldn't always be on the manager to run check ins. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, it, it, as you know if, uh, from probably, you, uh, I'm sure you've experienced Scrum along the way. It's not always the Scrum master that runs runs the uh, the scrums. It can be anybody in the team. Yeah, yeah, it does happen. Yeah, yeah exactly. So uh, have they stepped up? Have they done that? Uh, if they have failed, if they haven't quite hit their key results, what's the evidence of their learning from that? And how, have, most importantly, how have they applied those lessons uh, uh, for, uh, the next time around? That, I would argue, is a much stronger clearer view of high performance than just looking at whether somebody has achieved you know 80 percent or 100 yeah. percent. so that that's that's my view on how they can be linked now r the rest of that evaluation i would suggest that uh you know so that that, that there uh, that there's some evaluation against uh um, kpis if they have any influence over particular kpis and then also uh, the behaviours and values of the organisation and how how are they exhibiting and role modelling those as well. Yeah, we're definitely going that way, trying to link those things more uh, to behaviour and alignment to competences and, val and company values mm -hmm. rather than directly linking them to OKRs. Yeah. But that's a question that comes up a lot in Brazil, especially because those bonus and like reward structures based on goals. Yeah. It's something that we'd, we've had here for like years now mm -hmm. and then it's hard they hey, used to have goals that were directly linked to your, your bonus in, uh, at the end of the year, and mm -hmm. now you're going to have those OKRs which are not linked anymore. So uh, sometimes it can it can be a kind of a struggle to yes. to move, you know, from one model to another. So yeah, and it can be quite uh, it, it it can create quite a lot of anxiety for the individual as well because they. Yeah. If they might feel like they have no way of judging their own performance anymore. Yeah, yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. So how do I know I'm doing a good job? <laughs> yeah. You know. Totally and, get and, it. Yeah. So 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 long as that's not lost sight of, then then yeah, I think there's. Uh, I mean, that it's another it's another podcast. Uh, sorry, another webinar. <laughs> yeah, we that's another to. topic. It's, um, a massive, it's a massive subject area. That is. Yeah, that, it definitely is. So, okay, so we're getting to uh, 10.30, at, le at least here. Uh, I know it's a couple of hours. Uh, what what, uh, what yeah, time is it right now? What, coming up to 1.30 in the afternoon here. 1.30, okay. So we still have like over uh, 30 minutes here. Yeah, sure. uh, I, I think we could move to your research if you want to like yeah. show us a couple of your slides and, and we could yeah. keep on talking about it. Okay, no problem. Just bear with me a second. I shall start to share. Uh, Okay, has that come up now? Ah, there we go. Right, yes, I can see it now. Right, okay, so a little bit of background. Again, if, if you remember, I said before I'm quite a curious character, and I, I did my first research paper uh, about five years ago just on performance management in general. But then uh, at the beginning of this year, I was – kind of asking myself wouldn't it be great if uh if, if we kind of knew what it was that was a driving people to use okrs how they use them because obviously as we've said before they're a collection of principles and practices with multiple ways of interpreting and applying them so how are they using them what are they finding once they put them into play and if they were to do them again you know, with hindsight and reflection and learning the lessons, what would be their priorities? How would they approach them next time? So uh, so I started collecting data. Uh, and for this first report, uh, it's not – the data sample isn't as big as I'd like it to be. So I wouldn't say it's massively statistically valid. 
because uh, yeah. we only got responses from 20 organizations but we've already since publishing this and it and it's had a, a load of interest since 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 it's been published oh by the way those those 20 only a fraction of those were clients of ours so there's there's there's, there's quite a bit of independent if you will third party input into this yeah. um uh, we uh, uh, we've had a, a, a fantastic response to contributing to uh, the the online uh, survey, which is always open for people to respond to. Uh, so we're building up the data, the, the body yeah. of data for 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 the twenty twenty report. If you see what I mean, so I, I'm hoping to have at least a hundred uh, respondents for that one. So who responded to us? Okay, so. Uh, Sixty percent were in tech or software, uh, with twenty percent in professional services and twenty percent in manufacturing. So, by professional services, we mean uh, law, finance, insurance, that sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, I was also curious about the size of business. And fifty-five percent of respondents were actually from businesses of up to uh, eleven uh, hundred people. And now, that that's something that I pick up on a little bit later because I start to look at. You know, have have smaller organisations with fewer people, got different approaches to rolling them out, and it, 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 I certainly find later on that there is there is, there is a, a, a the the results did show that there was a difference. A bit of a spoiler alert. What I found was that uh, in smaller organisations of less than a hundred, they're more inclined to go right. Let's just do this and let's just push it out in one go. Yeah. Uh, so maybe, and this is perhaps, you know, a good piece of research always asks more questions than it answers. So my question there would be, oh, so does that mean then that smaller organizations have an inherent capability to absorb change a lot more, a lot, a lot quicker yeah. and a lot, a lot faster than, than larger organizations? Anyway, so yeah, so that that was that's what we found. We found that smaller organisations kind of took a, a big bang approach as opposed to larger ones, which tended to go more for a phased approach. Um, now, why were they thinking about using them? Well, you mentioned earlier alignment. Well, there you go. Eighty-five percent said that their primary reason was alignment with vision and strategy. Uh, so that was about building the clarity uh, and helping people to understand what the you know the, the top line goals were for the business and so that they could like i say be informed in their own decision making and their own actions uh 45% said employee engagement um which is interesting uh i mean i've had a debate with someone uh, on a couple of uh times about the relationship between alignment and engagement and can you actually have engagement without alignment uh, uh, yeah, I, I can see where, where it goes. Yeah, I think you can. I think you can have a load of really enthusiastic people but if they haven't got that clarity of direction. You know, I like it. Let me draw an analogy. You know, like I said, yeah. I'm, a rowing, I'm, I'm a rowing coach. If I've got a load of enthusiastic people in a boat, but they're not rowing in time, they're not in alignment, then that boat ain't going nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. But if you get them rowing in time, then that boat flies. You know, yeah. it's a, it, yeah. that, that's the difference between the two. Increased focus on growth. Um, this surprised me a little bit, actually, uh, because uh, in, in the use of OKRs, we found that the majority of businesses choose to use them for, for really focusing uh, people on what's going to make the biggest difference for the for the organization and that's usually growth but only 40 percent said that they uh, they felt that uh, they, they were using them primarily to get people focused on growth and then 25 percent said that they were using them for performance management of which you know 20 percent uh being of businesses of 100 people or more so that's out of that 25 percent only five percent of businesses of less than 100 people actually have them uh, actually, we're using them in in, uh, uh, in 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 performance management. So, yeah, um, how were they using them? Well, I was interested in the spread of OKRs across an organisation. So, uh, how many people were only contributing towards an OKR? Well, um, uh, for uh, for uh, organisations that had between 
20, 0 to 20% uh, of people covered with OKRs, uh, uh, they, uh, they, there were 35% of, of the respondents, you know, were using them really focused and only, you know, so that's saying that only 35% of respondents had less than 20% of the business using OKRs. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then when we moved it up to a little bit broader from 20 to 60%, uh, again, you know, another 20% on top of that was saying that, yes, we, we you know, we, we have uh, a broader use. And in terms of pushing OKRs out across the business and getting the majority of people to use OKRs, 45% yeah. of businesses said they use that. Now, I was particularly curious about this. I don't know how you found this, but what I find is that when businesses uh, say, right, we must do OKRs, everybody must have an OKR, um, I find that that's often driven by a desire to replace some form of performance management that's been there in the past. So everybody yeah. must have it. Yeah, it's, it's mostly that. I, I, can, yeah. I can agree, definitely. And, and consequently, I think it's a couple of things happen with that. And again, you know, interested to hear your thoughts on this. I find that uh, you end up with uh, OKRs being created for the sake of it, yeah. uh, not necessarily having a focus on growth, change, or innovation. Uh, and also, you know, if you work, if you're talking about a large organisation, everybody having OKRs means that that realignment has to be done on a possibly a quarterly basis every three months. And that's a hell of a lot of work to do. Uh, so, so uh, you know, and the whole point of <laughs> the whole point of OKRs is they're supposed to have a degree of agility to them. So, you know, I I have I personally have uh, real reservations about uh, you know everyone in the business having an OKR. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So so, and I believe that they shouldn't go down to individual level until. Uh, an organization is very, very experienced with them because I think that is the quickest way for them to become completely overwhelmed by the process, by, by using them. Um, yeah, I definitely li like uh, the phased approach approach mo more than the, like, well, one size fits all, like everyone's going to start a OKRs at yeah. the same time. Exactly. Uh, I think like one of the principles is, is being able to be uh, like top down and bottom up at the yeah. same time. Yeah. But if you just roll it out to everyone in the company, then you've just made it completely top down. Yeah. You know? <laughs> then you just broke one of the, the main principles that it's having a, this bottom up com component to it. And uh, I think it's something like uh, as it changes uh, your culture, your company culture, it's not something you can do from one day to another. So it's something that maybe takes a little bit of time. Yeah. And I, I can definitely agree that when, when you're doing like a full rollout in the first time in a big business, there are a lot of people who are just going to be doing it for the sake of it. Yeah. And and what they're going to be really thinking is, okay, so it's performance management like we did before, but just with another name. Yeah, on it. exactly. Yeah. Exactly, so, which, which when it comes to change management is one of the biggest uh, barriers to, to adoption because it just feels the same as what's gone before. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I was pleased to see this. I was pleased to see that 80% are using them for cross-functional working because that's where I think OKRs can really deliver the greatest benefit in, in helping to uh, uh, build focus and support around cross-functional initiatives that are going to really drive value for the business. Because again, don't know what your thoughts are on this, but we find that a lot of the clients that approach us, they're struggling with silos. Yeah, you know, these, fu these functional silos have, have, have emerged as they've grown and they've gone, ah, this is actually slowing us down. We need to start thinking cross-functionally here. So yeah, I was really pleased to see that. Yeah, I mean, like, we definitely see people asking us about, you know, like, the concept of squads that's very using, like, in Spotify. Uh, yeah. Squads, and, and there's other names that I just don't remember now, but mainly squads. And that's a question we get a lot. Like, how do you make, like, squads, which are basically cr cross-functional teams, work with OKR? So should the squad have an OKR? Or, or if that person belongs to 
sometimes a squad is made of people from different areas of the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so, yeah. so I get this question a lot. Should, should that person have an OKR related to that uh, business area that she came from? Or should she, uh, he or she have an OKR related to the squad that they're actually uh, currently working on? So that's something we get a lot. Um, well, again, I would say it depends what the strategy and the priorities that drop out of that strategy require. Yeah. And and this is this is something which um, I've seen a few times. And no matter whether you've got a, a, a traditional hierarchical organizational structure or whether you've got something that's a lot more agile and fluid, like Spotify's squad structure and and and, and so on, um, you you don't have to have an OKR map, an OKR structure, which completely mirrors your organizational structure. Yeah, because, yeah. because yeah. Uh, you know it may be that you know, a particular initiative is priority one for this particular quarter. And that's focusing on, I don't know, product development. But the next the next quarter, we need to be focusing on 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 UX or or, or, or uh, customer support. You know, and it's about where OKRs are your spotlight. And you guide that to shine on the part of the business which is going to deliver greatest value if it changes, transforms, grows over the course of the next quarter. It's not about shining on the entire business, and that that's a that's a big um, that's a big hurdle. That's a big mindset shift that we have to work on with senior teams because they want it all. They want to do it. They, they want it all, and they want it all within the next week. Yeah, yeah? I get it. You, you know, we have to get quite hard on them to 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 really really focus down to get to that that magic. You know, one, two, or possibly three things. Which are going to deliver the biggest impact over the course of the next, uh, the, the, ne the next, the next period, and, and make sure that that is what is communicated to people, so that they know what the priorities are. And sure, that may mean that some people fall out of scope of OKRs for the current period. Yeah, I, I have that feeling, uh, like a couple of times when people come talk to us, that they feel like if they don't do everything the company has to do, and mm -hmm. by the end of this quarter like the world is going to end and they failed yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah they yeah. failed yeah, yeah. and they all yeah. tell them like okay so you can narrow this down to just a couple of things yeah and then uh, deliver the, the best value that you can and then the next there's still a next quarter after that like you're all going to be here the company's going to be here focus yeah. on new things on the next yeah. quarter you don't need to do every single thing this quarter yeah um, just, I won't go through all the bullets, but I just wanted to highlight the one at the bottom because yeah. I think you might like this one, Gustavo. The question that was asked here was, did you seek external support in helping to set them up? Uh, and then uh, if you didn't, what would if you were to and, and were to do them again, what would be your decision the next time around? So 20% said that they sought external support. However, from those that didn't, 30% of them said that they would seek it next time around. So actually, <laughs> actually they kind of wish they'd asked for a bit of help. Um, okay. Uh, I mentioned before about the difference between, that was the, that was the spoiler that I gave you at the beginning about the difference between 35% said they did phased versus 65% uh, on Big Bang. Uh, but Big Bang was definitely the preference of those of less than 100 people. Okay. <laughs> And the most common OKR cycle was three months. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting, this one, because <clears throat> it's usually what we suggest clients start off with. But because we encourage them to do retrospectives at the end of every cycle, one of the questions which we encourage them to ask is, is the cycle itself the right length of time? And some clients have, have decided to move to uh, three, four-month cycles, for instance, uh, I've had one that's kept with three-month cycles, but then actually had a month in between each cycle to do the alignment work. And they were quite a large organization of a couple of thousand people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they were putting so much priority, so much focus onto that alignment activity that they felt it was actually worth investing, you know, a month in between. So they ended, ended up with three OKR periods, three OKR quarters in a 12-month period. Fine. That's not wrong. That's 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 a brilliant way of of, of, of testing, learning, and adapting. Um, and I, I think that works that works really well. Um, but you know, most people seem to opt for the three months, and that's that that's what we that's what we found. Um, in terms of impact that uh, 
they found the top four were increasing focus, yeah, from the from a better understanding, a clearer understanding, uh, uh, and uh, they found that uh, the teams, because they were kind of talking the same language, it made it yeah. easier to to discuss and track performance. <clears throat> there was a report of seeing a growth in not just results but also the ambition of, yeah. what, uh, of what teams in particular were, were believed they, that, they, that was possible. And interestingly, the main reason for OKR failure was the lack of support from the senior team from the C-suite. Yeah. So where a regardless of where it had come from, whether it had been the, the CEO had read Measure What Matters and said, make it work, or yeah. whether somebody in the organization had watched the Rich, Rich Cloud Google video and decided, right, this would be great, let's yeah. start it off, and it's come bottom up. Because the C-suite team were not kind of there as exemplars, there of role, role models showing this is how we're using it as a team and we're being completely transparent about this and so on and so forth. That's a fundamental part of change management. It's a huge part of change management, you know, to role model the behaviors that you want to see in others, the practices, the routines that you want to see in others. And that's that was found to be the biggest reason for OKR failure. And, and, and Roger, I know if, if you agree, but I think that's not only for your OKRs, right? For any like methodology oh, yeah. or, or anything you yeah. want to see in a company. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree. I'd agree. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for, for this number four, actually, uh, I was going to ask you if you didn't if you uh, didn't accidentally did this research in Brazil because like number four <laughs> is the one I see the most here. So uh, I've had this uh, situations where uh, there were some people really engaged in OKRs and they would uh, actually update this uh, C-suite people OKRs for them, uh, just so that other people would think that the C-suite actually cares. Yeah. So I've I've seen that happen really. Yeah, 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 I can believe that. I can believe that. And what I was also interested to see was how quickly they were seeing the impact of OKRs. And they was they were getting to uh, see outcome-focused OKRs be written by month nine. So that was typically yeah. the third cycle. And I don't know how you find it, but that's one of the biggest mindset shifts we have to work on to get them from defining key results that, that measure action to ones that measure actual impact outcomes. Yeah, th um, that's really hard here too. Like usually you yeah. start with tasks. Uh, yeah. People try to write tasks and set off actual results. Uh, and then it, well, it slowly moves on, but I could agree like maybe nine months, a couple, it takes a couple of cycles, definitely. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Having measurable key, key results as well, that that for many of them were reporting actually it took more than 12 months for us to get to that stage. Having aligned OKRs seemed to come quite quickly. I think it's because a lot of businesses seem to put, because it's their number one reason for using OKRs, they seem to put a lot of focus in making sure that those that are set at supporting levels of debt are, 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 are aligned. And uh, in terms of regular updates to OKRs, so regular check-ins working and so on, they were seeing that by the end of three months. So um, that was that was interesting to see that, 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 that those those were coming through relatively quickly. So on reflection, the final question which we asked them was, if you were to do them again, what would be your order of priority? Um, number one, make sure the vision and strategy are absolutely crystal clear. Number two, do the change management around it. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. You know, it, OKRs are not unique in terms of needing change management. Yeah. But it shouldn't be overlooked. It should, it should not be overlooked. They are in a, a, a major change to the way that uh, a large proportion of someone's work is done. And, you know, if anything, the, one of the first questions that we get asked is, oh, is this something more we have to do? Well, actually, not, <laughs> not really, because you you already be focusing on, on growth or change or innovation in some way. So it's just about taking that element of your work and just doing it in a slightly different way so it's not about putting more on top it's just about taking this bit and just kind of maybe doing it slightly differently which you might find might even help you yeah you know yeah. so so the, the that change management side of it putting effort into alignment of okrs i think that's interesting that it came as number three that 
um, because you know it's been stated as being the number one priority for, for using OKRs, but it's actually, on reflection, it's only number three in the charts at the moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, establishing the check-in routines, so making sure that those are kind of defined and you know, best practice uh, advice given in advance. Uh, the systemization of them, um, I mean, this will be good to your guy, to, to your ears, I guess, but um, yeah. I, I'm a huge fan of put, using a system because I don't think you can leverage the data that you can, you can generate off the back of OKRs without a good system. Yeah, definitely. And then finally, boosting the management skills to help drive OKRs. And for us, that is primarily um, coaching conversations and feedback skills, I think, are both yeah. essential. And then last but not least, which I was I was secretly quite pleased to see this last in the list, was integrating it into performance management. So uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so, great to see it in the last place, really. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just a final word. I mean, if you want to if you want to get a copy, I, I think it's been shared in the conversation, but if you want to get a copy of this report, just go to therebegiants.com and you'll see it come up on the front page. So just Click on that and you'll be able to get yourself a copy. Uh, just a couple of other things which I've just, just mentioned whilst we're here. We have the world's only, uh, or cer- certainly, actually, no, I think there might be a second one out there now, but we certainly have the world's first OKR podcast and we're on to season three already. Um, and if you, you can either access it through our website or you'll find it on any of the major pod class, po- podcast platforms like Spotify or Google or Apple. Uh, it's called Giant Talk, okay? So uh, you can go and find that. And then we've also got some really handy OKR tools and guides uh, on our website. But I'll send uh, these out to uh, these slides over to Code Blue so that um, everyone who's online can, uh, can receive a copy of them. Yeah, Roger. Uh, I was just checking out. So uh, it seems like... Um They've already posted the link of your research yeah. here in the comment section and also Fantastic. your your website's URL. So Fantastic. it's all here. Uh, Roger, so uh, I think we're, we're kind of done with the topic. So now we, we do have a couple of questions uh, from our, our audience that they really uh, probably want us to talk about. So the first one here is, how should I work with the CFRs and OKRs talking about cadence? Like, should it be linked <coughs> quarterly? Okay. Uh, forgive my ignorance, but CFRs means uh, like um, conversations, feedbacks, and recognition. Ah, right. Okay, right. Okay. okay. Um, so, should so, you, so the question is, how often should CFRs take place in relation to OKRs? Yeah, I think it's something like that. If they should like both be quarterly or or no. So, Assuming this uh, th- this question is being asked uh, because the the belief is that CFRs would be on a one to one basis, um, yeah. my my view on this is that uh, that you should be aiming to have those once a month. Um, but the OKR check ins, I would start at having those at least once a fortnight. I mean, it depends on the drumbeat of the organization. I know some some businesses actually choose to have them once a week, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah. I think if you leave them for a, longer than a fortnight, that you're starting to lose poten- potentially the agility to course correct if things are not quite going to plan. If you've got yeah. to wait another, you know, another three weeks before you're actually all sitting down together, yeah. so I, I would I would recommend. Um, Starting with a with a fortnightly cadence on OKR discussion, but for CFRs, I would say uh, once every month. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. great. So we, we do have another question here. Yeah, it's from uh, Luli Janeri. So um, uh, it says, uh, "I work in a bank with four thousand tech workers, and I'm struggling with how to unfold the OKRs throughout the organization. How to design a check in with all the workers? Is there any hint?" Uh, how to unfold them or how to design a check-in structure into an. Oh, right. You phased out then, but I think I've got it because I can, I can read the question at this. Uh, yeah, it was actually yeah. phased out in the comment section. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So that is, uh, that's a big challenge because of the size of organization. My, my, my questions there would be, uh, are you trying to put it down to individual level 
right from the very start, because as we've mentioned previously, I think that is uh, expecting too much. Uh, and also, uh, I believe you're really jeopardizing uh, the agility that OKR should have if you try and do that. Second is, um, I'm curious about the stage at which the rollout is at, because if you're if you're right at the beginning of this and you're trying to sort of push it across the organization in one go, then that's that's a hell of a task. And my recommendation would be to have a pilot to start off with, a very public and transparent pilot, which you use to uh, uh, to, to to communicate with the rest of the organization on how well it's going. You know, get people who are involved in the pilot to report on how it's going so that when it comes to uh, the rest of the organization starting to take on OKRs, uh, it, it becomes more of a pull than a push. Yeah. So you, you, you're literally doing a bit of internal marketing to kind of create a demand for OKRs. Uh, and that would be my advice around that. In terms of how the, I mean, uh, I think the question also asks about designing the check-ins. Yeah, I am a yeah, big, yeah, I'm a big believer in allowing the teams to design their own check-in, as long as what they are provided with is a clear uh, uh, view as to what's expected as output. You know, it's 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 essentially kind of taking almost like a key result approach to this you know the key the key result is there's an output every two weeks from the team on their okrs now you know but then you're allowing the team to design what that conversation looks like that gets them to that point of output or update you're not stating you must sit down you must answer these questions you must do it within 30 minutes you must do it you know yeah, you, you can't, yeah. And, and that actually that that brings me to another point about um, key results um, you know I, I, we were saying before just how difficult it is to get people to writing outcome focused key results I think if you can crack that I think it goes right to the heart of the general management culture of the business because if you're writing if, 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 you're, a, if you're a senior manager and you write your key result as a task you're giving those that need to align into it no room to think no room to be creative you're you're telling them how to do something now chances are you've probably spent a fortune on recruiting them you're probably spending a fortune on paying them uh, and you you brought them in to use their expertise you know for their their insight uh, let them use it tell them where you want them to get to and then say right over to you work out how to get there that's that's an outcome focused key result, and that's a completely different conversation. A completely different conversation. Yeah, that, that, that was brilliant. I, I told I, I couldn't agree more. And I think when you're we're talking about like des designing like a check in structure, mm -hmm. uh, it depends a lot from uh, also for what area of the business you work in. So maybe uh, from for a certain team, it, it may make sense to uh, do those check ins weekly. For some other team, maybe like yeah, exactly. every two weeks. So. It's not going to be like a in such a big company like a, a structured pattern like pattern that you're going to yeah. follow in every single team because and, and they have different needs and um, like basis. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, so, so there's another question also. So, uh, is a uh, 360 degree feedback useful to engage in the OKR model? Um, I guess in terms of the CFRs that you mentioned earlier. I yeah. think so. Uh, I think it's part of. I think it's more part of um, an individual's personal and professional development, uh, yeah. which, which which I think is, is 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 a process that's very close to OKRs because again, it's about how some. I think that goes to the heart of how somebody works with their OKRs and how they're learning from them and how they're applying that learning and adapting and so on. Um, so I think three hundred and sixty it does have a role to play. What I would say is don't use it too often because it can drive fatigue. If everybody's asking for 360, you know, feedback at the same time, then, you know, you can get absolutely bombarded with requests and it can become quite quite cumbersome. 
Um, but there are some really good uh, 360 tools out there now that instead of asking this big, you know, questionnaire, uh, at, 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 you know, once a year, they kind of just maybe fire a question to a teammate, say once a week and say, can you just score me, you know, this week on this? And they might cycle through the same questions, like I say, at one a week over a course of like, you know, two or three months. And so at the end of the 12 months, you've actually got quite a nice sort of full picture. And I think that's a, that's kind of like a, a nice way of doing it. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's all part of, feeding back into, you know, a, a performance eva uh, um, uh, evaluation and, and professional development. Yeah, I, I think just like we talked about um, OKR, like designing OKR check-ins, yeah. you're desiring this structure of 360 feedback. You should also uh, maybe roll out this like slower and try to figure out what's the best a routine to follow and not go for for some uh, very structured framework like oh you get, you got to do this once a week yeah. and it's the only way we're like never i would never go this route so maybe uh try doing like every two weeks and then if, if you feel like that's too much then you can make it more like a uh, few more time apart than maybe monthly and you don't know, just keep learning from it uh, and if you're eventually going to find what the best routine is for your team yeah i completely agree i completely agree so Roger, oh, we're just over an hour here. Uh, so uh, I think we're probably, uh, we could be talking here for the whole day. We could, uh, can we? <laughs> I, I do have a, a whole lot of questions I want to ask you, but I think that's gonna be for maybe, an, uh, an, maybe that's an opportunity to ask you to talk to us again in another webinar. Yeah, definitely, uh, I'd be happy to. Okay then. Well, so basically that's it. I don't know if anyone has any more questions. We don't wanna take uh, so much more of Roger's time. He was really kind to join us here today. But, well, I think there are no, no other questions left. So basically that's it, Roger. Uh, thanks a lot for, for get, coming by and talking to us. It was really great experience. I, I could definitely learn a lot from you. And uh, I've been learning a lot today. And okay, let's, let's just talk another time. You're always uh, invited my, to come and talk to us. My pleasure. I'd, I'd be more than happy to, more than happy to. Okay, then. Well, so, uh, everyone else here we're gonna have two more webinars this week so the other one is in a few hours uh, we're gonna talk about the, the biggest OKR implementation case in Latin America and then there's another one tomorrow about continuous performance management as a, as a whole with Coblu CEO so th those two are gonna be in Portuguese um, and th this was the only one in English actually but, it, but you can you can try and check it out if you want and yo that's it okay okay thanks very See much guys right okay cheers Cheers.